Meet the World War II experts who work on the battlefield. This is the Bunker Boys Show with your host, Tony Cisneros. Hi everyone, welcome to the Bunker Boys Show. If you are even remotely into World War II, this is the show for you. We're moving on to episode three. Today we have Roland Gall of Gall's Legacy Tours. He's going to be giving us a history lesson on Luxembourg in World War II. Later on in the episode, we're gonna have Nashville Exile, the band that we've mentioned to you before. They're actually going to be performing a special song for us and then we'll talk to uh, some of the band, including Nick Aaron, who is the actor who played uh, Popeye Wynn on Band of Brothers. He actually sings with the band off and on, and uh, he will be joining them in an interview later on in the episode with Reg, our co-host. We just finished up our D-Day special. We certainly hope that you got a chance to watch that. If you haven't, we hope that you'll go back and watch it. It's an hour and a half long episode. Uh, we kind of focus on the, the British beaches because they're stories that we think Americans really haven't heard much, but we will go back to Normandy later on in the season. We'll have Paul Woodage back, our series guest, our expert in Normandy, who will be talking to us more about what took place on the American beaches there at Utah and Omaha Beach. If you've never been to Luxembourg during your travels in Europe, you should ask yourself why. It's a tiny little country. Of course, most people just shoot right through it in less time than it takes to eat lunch. But it is an amazingly beautiful country. The people are wonderful. They all speak four languages fluently. Uh, it's a wealthy country, rich in, in industry and, of course, tourism, beauty, scenery, uh, lots and lots to see there packed in this tiny little spot in the cent right in the middle of Europe. So uh, let's bring on Roland Gall. We're going to get right into it and talk to Roland about Luxembourg's role during the Second World War. Uh, I've asked Roland to kind of just set the stage for us here since we just did our Normandy episode uh, to kind of give us the scene of what the situation was after D-Day leading up to the winter of 1944-45. And of course, this is all from the perspective of the Luxembourgers, uh, starting in May of 1940. Welcome, Roland Gall of Gall's Legacy Tours. It's so great to see you again, Roland. Um, I've really been looking forward to this conversation with you, uh, talking about Luxembourg and Luxembourg's role in World War II. So uh, how are you? And it's great to see you. Hi, Tony. Pleasure is on my side, definitely. and. Uh, um... Really looking forward to participate a little bit in, in, in this show and tell you a little bit in your audiences about uh, the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg, the World War II experience, and then maybe a little bit about the liberation, the two liberations of Luxembourg. We are a small country in Western Europe, and we had basically the honor of being liberated twice by US forces, once in September 1944, and then subsequently, as the Germans came back during what was to be called later on the Battle of the Bulge, General Patton's Third Army again had to re-liberate territories of the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg that the Germans had overrun in December 44-45. So Luxembourg, two liberations of Luxembourg. But uh, first of all, uh, maybe uh, just a little bit of World War II history in a nutshell. Luxembourg, small nation, small country, independent country, uh, was overrun on May 10, 1940. Luxembourg had no army. They had armed guards along the border to demonstrate our neutrality. So the neutrality was just ignored as the Germans were pouring into uh, Belgium, into the Netherlands, into Luxembourg on the way to attack France. So that was May 10, 1940. Given the size of the country, a little bit larger than the state of Rhode Island, uh, within half a day, the Germans had control of the entire territory. They disarmed the Luxembourg border guard soldiers and state police. And uh, basically then they occupied the territory. But after uh, Holland, 
Belgium and later on France had capitulated or been defeated, we were not just occupied, we were forcibly made parts of Nazi Germany. In other words, the Luxembourgers who had celebrated their 100th anniversary of independence in 1939, they became forced German citizens for the ensuing four years until the first American liberations. And the worst the Germans did, of course, they conscripted by force the Luxembourg male youth into the German armed forces. And the women, they were sent to Germany, uh, not for the armed forces, but for any support organizations within the Nazi organization, uh, like the Reichsarbeitsdienst or the German uh, labor service. So there was nothing we could do except hope for better times. And of course, the better times they came when the news got around of June 6, 1944, the Allies finally have landed. Of course, we were still under occupation in June 1944. People had no access to news. But somewhat news had filtered down, basically, that the Allies have landed and maybe after at the end of June that they had a foothold now in Normandy and that they were spearheading east. East means basically in the direction of Paris and from Paris it's not far to Luxembourg. So uh, after basically the breakout of Normandy and especially let's say the first American army was first and then only they brought Patton's Third Army on theater, which then uh, came to the creation of the 12th Corps under General Bradley. You had two armies, First American Army and Third American Army, spearheading through France in the direction of the German border. So uh, when Paris got finally liberated in uh, August, late August, uh, August 24, 25, 26, 27, 1944, by American and French forces, that news flashed around the country and the Luxembourgers still under German occupation. Uh, they were reassured, it's a question maybe of about a few weeks or perhaps a couple of months until the first American troops would show up here. They knew from the little news that they had gotten uh, through various channels that Luxembourg geographically lay in the advance of the American forces after the breakout of Normandy versus the British and the Canadian forces. They were further up north, so Belgium or Holland, whereas our country and parts of France later on, they came under the, uh, the progression of the uh, American army. So people, especially living in the south of our country and especially around the capital, Luxembourg City, had a main commuter train station. Every day, uh, as of, let's say, late August, early September 1944, train loads arrived from France with wounded so uh, German soldiers with uh, damaged equipment and so forth, and all in the direction east towards the German border. There were a couple of American aerial raids on, for instance, on these uh, Luxembourg uh, commuter stations and so forth, but secretly people were preparing uh, for being liberated within a few days. It is recorded that the very first American soldier, unfortunately we don't know his name, a man of a dismounted three-man patrol set foot onto Luxembourg territory, crossing from France into Luxembourg on a reconnaissance mission uh, where they made contact with an, a farmer tending to his cattle or to his crops in the field and asking a few questions when he had seen the last German soldiers. So he gave a little information, the little he had about the Germans in that area, and then the Americans withdrew. That was September 3rd, 1944. But that news immediately uh, went through the entire country like a wildfire. People were really uh, tearing uh, up German flags, cutting those up and using the red cloth 
for instance, to make stripes, uh, uh, patching those together with white stripes and turning a, a Nazi flag into a 48 star American flag and hiding that. Of course, they were risking that neck, their necks because the Germans, the Nazis, were still there, but already in organized retreat. September 9, 1944 is really the day of the first liberation when the south of the country uh, got uh, uh, liberated by uh, uh, units of the 5th U.S. Armored Division. 5th U.S. Armored Division, 1st Army, that uh, liberated the city of Petange, and that's also where the first American soldier uh, with the name of Heyman Josephson met a violent death when his uh, Greyhound armored car uh, was ambushed uh, in that town, and uh, he died, unfortunately, uh, alive in the, uh, uh, in the uh, armored car. A few days later, uh, at that time, the Americans had already controlled the citizens of uh, uh, the city of Petange. They already erected a small memorial at the place where this unfortunate soldier who is recorded to be the first American killed on Luxembourg ground died. And since then, this has become a tradition that every September 9, uninterrupted uh, since 1944, the citizens gather and hold a silent tribute to that soldier. There's a beautiful memorial there. But that's a different question. We can talk about that later. September 10, 1944, the big push, the big advance of the three combat commands of the uh, uh, 5th Armored Division towards the capital. So the capital was liberated on September 10, 1944. And what makes it unique, the Americans brought back our Crown Prince, at that time, Crown Prince Jean, who eventually was to become Grand Duke Jean, who passed away, unfortunately, last year. So he was... Uh, an allied soldier in British uniform of the Irish Guards, because when the family during the occupation went into exile, he volunteered to become a combat soldier. And since they stayed in London, so he got his training as an officer in the British Army, and he became a first lieutenant in the Irish Guards. So he was serving with the Irish Guards at that time, they were already in Belgium. They had already crossed from France into Belgium and were liberating uh, the capital of Belgium, Brussels. So when it became obvious that the Americans, they were liberating Luxembourg within a few days, they detached him from British command, put him under American command to make sure that the future chief of state of Luxembourg would be with the uh, liberating American forces. And that uh, it, it's an incredible atmosphere of four years uh, being liberated by 10,000s of people. They were in the streets cheering at the tanks, children mounting on the tanks, girls kissing anybody that looked kissable, parsing out drinks, flowering the soldiers, and then shouldering uh, Crown Prince Jean and then bringing him into uh, the capital. So that was the September 10th liberation, which is our key date for the first liberation. One day later, September 11, 9-11, 1944, it was up to my hometown, which is in the north on the edge of the Ardennes and the surrounding areas uh, to be liberated. The Germans didn't put up really a fight. They destroyed a number of bridges. So to slow down the American advance as they were retreating, towards the West Wall, crossing the Sauer, the Ur, and the Moselle River, and take up a defensive line on their territory in mainland Germany, uh, behind the West Wall. September 11, 1944 is also recorded when the first American soldier set foot on mainland Nazi Germany. His name was Sergeant Joseph Warner Holzinger of German origin, he again was part of a patrol that crossed the Ur River near the town of Vienden, which is about 12 kilometers from where I live. And the uh, wire services at that time, they cranked that news. It flashed all around the liberated world. The Yanks have arrived in Nazi Germany. Again, the Germans didn't put up much of a fight, given the territory of Luxembourg the size 
one can say that by September 14, uh, we were totally under American control. And the fights later on, they went on towards the Belgian-German border, which later on was eventually to develop into that battle that should never have taken place, Hurtgen Forest. But during that time, we had no government here in September 44. Our government was in London as an exile government together with the Grand Duchess, so that's the uh, present Grand Duke's grandmother. She also became the symbol of resistance during World War II, although she was in, in London uh, with an exile cabinet. Um, basically, <clears throat> uh, we had no government, they were still there. And so the U.S. Army basically jumped in and created some kind of a temporary civil affairs government, making sure that there was law and order, that there was uh, running water, medical supplies, food, electricity, and so forth, and that there was no lynch justice. Unfortunately, not all the Luxembourgers during the occupation were patriots, and so for everybody tried to survive, but quite a, a few from this, a, 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 a very few from this little population at that time, maybe 260,000 inhabitants for the entire country, they were pro-German and got sucked in as the Nazis had control of our country, and they, of course, got a very rough treat by their own countrymen, as we know also from France or from liberated Belgium and so forth. So thanks to uh, the American presence here, uh, they got they got jailed and became, got a fair trial. And then later on, either w w whatever, they were sued and uh, 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 that was it. So that's basically to set the stage, uh, the breakout from Normandy, the dash through France, liberation of Paris, the advance towards Luxembourg and the stop of the American advance at the West Wall at the Luxembourg uh, German border or at the Belgian German border. Wow, fantastic. So, right, at that time then, um, about the same time that uh, this was going on, the the battle for the Hurricane Forest uh, was was beginning to, to start, the prodding uh, uh, south of Aachen uh, into that area of the Hurricane Wald. And um, so what, what happened next? I mean, of course, Market Garden took place, the failed airborne operation <clears throat> in Holland in September, mm -hmm. um, starting on the 17th of uh, September 44. But after all that, uh, then by the winter of 1944, um, what's going on in Luxembourg, uh, say, by the beginning of December 44? Mm -hmm. Well, actually, then from uh, late September 1944, uh, until the beginning of the Battle of the Bulge, which nobody had uh, ever anticipated, Luxembourg became an R&R, &R, a rest and recreation area. Uh, the GIs called it a paradise for weary troops. Let's not forget the war was not over, but normal life had gradually come back to Luxembourg and uh, we had numerous garrison towns here for this or that American unit that had just arrived in France and liberated France and was moved closer to where the front line was, or they badly needed a break from the fighting at Hurtgen Forest or at that border area. So Luxembourg was ideal as a transit country. Of course, now, the liberated Luxembourgers, they were extremely hospitable and they broke their neck basically to provide everything to make the lives of their liberators a little bit more comfortable and so forth, offering home stays, especially in the north of the country, which is our agricultural belt. There were large farmhouses, barns were cleared out so that maybe a platoon could march in <clears throat> and uh, basically stay there with a dry roof on top because at that time also in October, November, bad weather started already to kick in and the troops, they preferred uh, some home hospitality and home cooking rather than staying in these lousy leaking pup tents out in, because the troops were still there closer to the German border with Luxembourg, uh, which was called basically this, this line that uh, stretches way into Belgium towards the uh, area of saint -Vet. Um, that was basically a defense line that was held in turn by several American units who then were rotated. 
after, let's say, uh, two or three weeks of frontline duty in the Hurtgen Forest, <clears throat> they were decimated there or they, 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 <clears throat> they badly needed a break. So they brought them down to Luxembourg <clears throat> and they went into defensive position bordering with Germany. Of course, the Germans, they were very quiet. They were hiding behind their west wall uh, line in their bunkers and pillboxes and ditches and so forth. And uh, from Luxembourg here, there was no order to penetrate into Germany. And of course, as the Germans at that time in our country were very, very quiet, there was hope that eventually the German army would quit before the end of the year, which turned to be out a fatal mistake. It was a failure uh, of Allied intelligence uh, at that time. During that time, we had uh, especially the 28th U.S. Infantry Division, the Red Keystone Division from Pennsylvania, because uh, they had been badly mauled at Hurtgen Forest, and whatever was left of the division was rotated back to Luxembourg to rest and uh, take up defensive positions, enjoy some home hospitality, put their equipment back to snuff again, and wait for orders uh, wherever they may want to come for the, the, the next action. And they were thinly spread, holding uh, the, the line bordering from Lux uh, between Luxembourg and Germany, with uh, two uh, or three regiments in line. Basically, all these regiments they were pretty much understaffed. But during that time, there was a steady stream of uh, new recruits coming from the states to take up the gaps basically left in, in, the, in the rows of the soldiers. These soldiers, they were green soldiers. Most of them, they had never seen combat yet. And so they were assigned to frontline duty and also assigned to units that had a few experienced soldiers so that the, 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 uh, the old elder soldiers, they could pass on the practical knowledge to these uh, 18, 19 year old kids that had not seen active combat yet. And it was precisely those who on the first day, December 16, when all hell broke loose, which eventually later on became known as the attack, the Battle of the Bulge, they held. They held for three days until they were basically wasted. But due to their stubborn resistance, uh, a number of uh, German objectives could not be reached according to planning. And one of these towns, of course, later on, we'll see that was Bastogne or saint -Vit because uh, the, the presence of these uh, two, uh, uh, green soldiers and experienced soldiers in Luxembourg, the 28th Division, with little support or so, but making good use of the impossible terrain of the Ardennes in Luxembourg. It's especially steep inclines, deep gorges, uh, tall hills, especially uh, little uh, windy roads at that time, most of them, they were solid dirt. They were not even tarmac. Uh, the Germans had enormous problems crossing into Luxembourg. It was a paradise for the defenders, albeit unexperienced, but nonetheless, they helped. So the, the prelude to the Battle of the Bulge in this sector uh, was basically that it's the 28th Division, the 9th Armored Division, uh, the 4th Infantry Division, all of the eight Corps of General Troy Middleton that held the front line here to make sure that later on reserves could be mobilized, which then came when General Patton's Third Army later on uh, basically uh, spearheaded, first of all, to um, the priority targets like Bastogne to liberate Bastogne and then eventually later on liquidate the bulge, as, as it was called, under the most adverse uh, weather conditions. How does Luxembourg treat the war history, and uh, how do the people feel about this? You mentioned the, the one ceremony uh, that takes place um, without any pause. Uh, what other kinds of ceremonies take place, and, and how do the Luxembourgers feel about military tourism? Well, uh, actually, Luxembourg has never forgotten these dramatic and tragic events. So of course, it's now 75 years, and we just uh, experienced a wonderful commemoration together with our Belgian friends. We all do this together with the Belgians, some with the French and also the Germans, because the Germans living in the border area in the Eiffel, so the German part of the uh, Ardennes, 
they considered themselves liberated. They were plain people that were not not really pro-Nazi, but they couldn't do otherwise. Any, anyway, that's a different story. So um, Luxembourg has never forgotten about that. And as early as probably the late 60s or early 70s, uh, there was a couple of civic action groups here uh, that started um, constructing memorials at significant points in Luxembourg where the battle was very intensive. We all knew at that time Bastogne had its beautiful Marta Son memorial. So the Luxembourgers were lagging a little bit behind, but thanks to this uh, civic action group, a number of memorials <clears throat> where the battle was very intense were created. And since then from the seventies to the eighties, the fifties anniversary, the sixties anniversary, uh, there was basically a, a rush uh, for uh, more of these uh, memorials, as in those days already, the first Americans, uh, tour buses or families came back to walk the former battlefields, pay tribute to a fallen comrade who's buried at the American Luxembourg Cemetery in Ham, uh, where also General Patton is, is resting. So gradually more and more Americans came and always were transiting through Luxembourg. And thanks to these civic groups, uh, if an, a na almost a national effort was made, well, we owe something to our liberators. And so that's why in most towns, mayors immediately were extremely supportive when somebody uh, came up with an idea, well, why don't we create a plaque here because uh, the battle here was so costly and many uh, young men lost their lives here or this or that and, and so forth. <clears throat> so within a few years, we had over a hundred American uh, memorials here. And that effort has been supported by the Luxembourg government, by the mayors, and now, of course, with our Belgian friends just across the border who shared equally the whole hardship of the Battle of the Bulge in the Belgian Ardennes, we sometimes jointly do together commemorative ceremonies. And that was certainly the case during the 60th anniversary already in 2004, then to, uh, uh, sorry, to 2014, and then the uh, 65th anniversary, and now probably the last hooray, unfortunately, if I may say, the 75th anniversary in last December where at least we could welcome uh, eight American veterans, also one German veterans. And they, they shook hands as a powerful sign of uh, reconciliation. I can't wait for our next episode together to hear more about Luxembourg and its role in World War II. Uh, thank you so much for coming on today. I hope everyone enjoyed this episode with Roland Gall, uh, Gall's Legacy Tours and um, can't wait to see you again, Roland. Thank you so much for coming on. My pleasure, our pleasure. Absolutely, thank you. Thanks so much, Roland. I could listen to him all day. It's absolutely incredible how much information he has. Roland Gall founded the Dekirk Historical Society back in 1982. It was a group of World War II enthusiasts, um, researchers and collectors who then started the Dekirk Military Museum uh, a couple years after that, and that became then the National Museum of Military History in Luxembourg. Absolutely incredible place. You could spend days there. So next time you get to Luxembourg, plan to spend some time in Dekirk. Next, we're going to talk to uh, Reg Jans, and um, we'll actually have him do his Stories and Stuff segment. He will be talking about Don Burgett, a paratrooper with the 101st Airborne Division, and then we will have our special appearance of Nashville Exile, the band. Here's Reg Jans and Stories and Stuff. In Best Stone. Donald Burgett's unit was sent out to infiltrate behind friendly lines to pinch out German infantry that had broken through the defense lines earlier that day, December 21, 1944. Engaging with the enemy with small arms fire, several members of Don's platoon were killed in action or wounded in action. All of a sudden, Don gets hit in the face and is knocked down to the chilly ground. He thought he was going to die. He started touching his face, looking for the bullet entrance wound. 
To his surprise, there was no such wound. From the corner of his eye, he sees a German soldier in an American foxhole jumping up and down like a jack-in-the-box, shooting at the Americans. Now it was that soldier that had fired around at dawn in order to kill him, but he missed. The bullet had snapped the strap of Don's helmet, causing his chin cup to flip up and hit him in the eye, knocking him down to the ground. Don stayed very low and he was waiting for the right moment to fire back at the German. He fired one single round and he could see the German helmet roll away. Don stood up, ran to the foxhole and saw the dead soldier lying there. He removed him from the foxhole, jumped in there himself, placed his rifle on the dead German's belly and continued shooting at the enemy. While doing that, Brigitte noticed the dead German's belt buckle and it seemed to be a German Fallschirmjäger, a paratrooper. Don took that buckle from the dead soldier and took it back home to the United States. He had it chromed and he wore it to work every day after the war. Love those stories and stuff with Reg. Good job, Reg. An amazing story about Don Burgett. And if you didn't quite catch that, he was actually an American paratrooper with the 101st Airborne Division. So he felt some type of connection with that German paratrooper. And uh, I think possibly he kept the belt buckle because it was a way for him to feel like somehow he was still connected with the person who gave his life so uh, Don could, could live. Anyway, uh, let's continue on now with our uh, appearance of Nashville Exile. I have to thank Red Johns, my co-host, for, uh, for connecting us with, uh, with this band. They are an amazing group of artists, and uh, they have been continually contributing to this program. If you didn't catch it the first episode when we had Winston um, in England, the, the Winston Churchill impersonator on, at the end of that episode, there was the song in the credits was actually a cover song of Mr. Churchill Says by the Kinks, 1969 song, and Nashville Exile did that cover. Uh, they just, they're, they're amazing, amazing uh, musicians. So uh, let's have Nashville Exile on here as they play Mary Jane's Last Dance, and then after the song, we'll see Reg Jan's uh, interview, Nashville. <laughs> i 
How are you doing? Good, Sorry, man. I'm late. Yeah. <laughs> Stay behind. Who's that? Hello, Rick. How are you doing, buddy? You're right. Yeah, good. You well? Yeah, good. What are we chatting about? Well, we just uh, started. We're talking about your gigs in Normandy in the past years. Um, Matthew just pointed out that he'd been on stage with you several times, but it's not you. Uh, but uh, you know, a lot of your fellow actors, uh, cast members from bands joined you on stage in Carenton uh, two years ago to sing along with you. But it's not just them, because you've been on stage, uh, Matthew, last December with the granddaughter of General George Patton, who sang oh, yeah. along with you. You know, you've been on stage joined by a World War II veteran, uh, Vincent Speranza. Now they yeah. just climb on stage, join the band, and, and that's, that's amazing. No, Rick, uh, we, uh, we're going to talk a bit more later. Rick, uh, your connection, you have a lot of connection with, uh, with uh, World War II because uh, you were very active in the, at the local museum. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, well, I've been into this since a kid. You know, both my grandparents served. One of them was a Spitfire pilot. And, uh, you know, I was into it early on. Um, I now live on purely by coincidence. I didn't plan this, but where I live now, is on what was Hawkinge Airfield in Kent. So it was a, a very active Battle of Britain airfield, the closest airfield in the UK to France. You can see the coast, uh, French coast from here. And I've, I've been living here about a year and a half. I've ended up getting to know, again, through just circumstance, getting to know the guys at the museum. And uh, I've got more and more involved and we're restoring uh, a Bristol Blenheim and a Heinkel 111 at the moment. And it's fantastic. Wow. It's great to be out there. Oh, I bet it is. I bet it is. Matthew, you said you had some fellow family members that served as well. One granddad was a merchant, uh, merchant navy, and then uh, I had another, uh, another granddad that was in Burma. Actually, he was a, it was a cook in in Burma. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Now, uh, Nick, of course, you know, people know you uh, from from the big screen, from the stages, being an actor. Now, one of your connections with World War Two is, of course, your your big part in 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 band the brothers playing Popeye Wynn um is there another are you connected to the world War II history in any other way you know instead of band the brothers I don't think so um I mean, my granddad was a chef in in, in in the army around world war ii um actually I think he met pretty sure he met my grandmother in Berlin because my grandmother's German okay um and then uh, got her, got her out of Berlin, um, and where they uh, to Wales when they got married. So uh, I had a kind of 
had a foot in both camps, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some call it playing safe. You know, it's, uh, yeah, exactly, yeah. It's that, sitting on the fence. <laughs> sitting on the fence, exactly. Yeah. So, now, about Nashville Exile. Um, Matthew, you're a vocalist, guitar player. Can you kind of point, like, explain to us like, how the band, how it all got started for Nashville Exile? Uh, well, we've we've uh, we've all played in bands uh, for, for a long time, years. Um, but we make our living from playing music, and uh, we we just decided to to form a band to play music that, that that we not that we don't like the other music, but music that we love. You know, by by uh, a lot of American artists uh, and some British artists as well. So we play a lot of Bob Dylan and Neil Young and the Rolling Stones and that type of thing. Um, so that that's how it formed really and 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 it's a it's a drum bass female singer and guitar and icing as well yeah, so of course because it's not just the three of you because you got you got cat who's like a great singer you got yeah. mark smithers who's the bass player of the band that's um, right so there's this um well nice so you were all original nick so where, how did where did you fit in 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 nashville exile because were you like an original member of the band or no how did you no get so so basically, um, well, Matt and me were in a band together like, God, like 15 years ago um, called Silver Lake. Uh, uh, and actually, we were really good. We used to get quite a good following. Um, it, was a, it, was a, it was a bit of a, now thinking about it, it was a bit of a who's who. It was. It was in the crowd. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But, um, so we had Matt and me go back quite a while, uh, playing in bands, and it was an original band. And then... There was when we were going to Bastogne, um, Matt sent me a message just saying, "Are oh, you going to Bastogne? Because Rick and me might might go there too." And then I just had this light bulb moment, thinking, "Well, screw it. Do you want to play a gig?" And so I sent Tim Gray a message just saying, "Look, um, how about how about I bring a band?" <laughs> Just totally just chanced it and he went for it and just said, yeah, sure, why not? You know, Tim sent me an email saying, hey, Rich, can you fix that? Uh -huh. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, We're so happy to have you on the show. I always tell Tony, like, hey, let's, let's do an interview with the, with, with the show band. Yeah, the show band. Like, yeah, the show band. <laughs> um, but, but anyway, you'll be um, maybe not every episode, but every other episode maybe, or uh, uh, bringing some music to us um special songs with a special link or connection to yes. you, to world war ii um uh we, of course we, the, the, the artistic freely the artistic freedom is yours so you can whatever you like if you want to see the white cliffs of dover in a motorhead version i really would love <laughs> to hear that <laughs> um, that's never been done before that's I never been done that. before yeah you've got to be original here and everything we, you do oh. We can we can do a, a Vera Ling song, I'm sure, uh, in uh, maybe not Motorhead, but uh, uh, maybe who knows? But yeah. definitely, yeah. yeah it, it, uh, or it could be Slipknot or anything. But, but anyway, um, no, we're, we're really. <laughs> we do Vera, we're, we're, do, we, why don't we do Vera Ling in a style of Slipknot? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, or the other way around, do a Slipknot song in a Vera Ling yeah. song, yeah, or whatever. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Um, so uh, we we're very looking forward to it. Um, or maybe, uh, I don't know, if our viewers have any suggestions or good ideas to challenge you. Yes. Uh, these, uh, these ideas are always welcome uh, on our Facebook page, uh, on the website, bunkerboys.com. Send us a message with your ideas. If you have a, and if you have a really great challenge for the band, we'll forward it and we'll see what we can do about that. Send, okay. send your requests. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And money. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. We'll do it. We'll make it happen. It'll be fun. It'll be a good challenge. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we're really happy to have you guys on the show. Now, if you'd like more information on Nashville Exile, if you want to book him or you have any questions, Matt, can you share you, the, the website? Yeah. Yeah. The, the best place to find us is on Facebook. So if you, if you search in Facebook Nashville Exile or just go facebook.com forward slash Nashville Exile, uh, the place and... Uh, exile then uh, then you'll find us and send us a message send us requests for songs and things like that we have t-shirts for sale we have lovely t-shirts um cds ah Absolutely. beautiful reg yeah. so I, I made that for you 
<laughs> You're too good, man. Look at that. Love it. Outstanding. Hey, listen, uh, a big thank you for uh, what you do for the show. I was very blessed to have you guys here uh, for the short interview. Um, Thank because you. you. I know you guys are very busy. Well, well, less busy than normal, but you're probably still busy. Um, so I would like to thank you for your time in joining me here on the show. Thank you, thank you Matthew Crozer, Rick Kent, Nick Aaron. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks for having us. Have a good. Great to see you. Thanks for having us. Cheers, Rich. Thanks. Awesome, you guys. Absolutely awesome. Really incredible, incredible music. Thank you so much, Reg, Rick, Matt and Nick Aaron for taking the time to uh, put that music video together and uh, taking the time out of your schedule to, to talk to us and appear on the show. We love the music, keep it coming. And uh, again, um, thank you from the bottom of our hearts. That's it, everybody. That is episode three. We'll be coming back at you in two weeks on June 24th. We'll have Reg Jans back on and a special guest. And then we'll see you on July 8th, two weeks after that with our, our series guest, David Harper. Uh, from Berchtesgaden, and uh, he will be talking about the Eagle's Nest and uh, the Ober Salzburg, Hitler's compound down there, the Berghof, Hitler's house, lots and lots of interesting things coming up uh, over the next several episodes. So stay tuned, everybody. Keep in touch. Uh, visit our website, please. Uh, we're also on Facebook, uh, WW2 Bunker Boys. We're on Twitter now at Bunker Boys Show. So um, uh, give us a like and uh, please subscribe and we will see you next time. America, be safe. I salute you.